Good Sunday morning. God bless you, House of Praise family. Pastor Steve uh, here this morning and just enjoying the outdoors, actually sitting here on our back deck this morning. And uh, we just know that God has got such good things in store for all of us. Uh, you know, the Lord promises us in his word that all the plans that I have for you are good. And uh, so that you will have a bright and an exciting future. And uh, I don't care what has happened. And there's been a lot of difficult things that we've had to face here in the last couple of months. But it's all going to work together for good. And the Lord has directed me to say that over and over again. And I'm going to say it again this morning. It's all going to work together for good to those who love God and to those who are called according to his purposes. This morning, the Lord has given me something really very special here as we continue to look into the end times and uh, the message that Christ had for the churches of Revelation. The Lord has given me something very intense here this morning, and uh, uh, I just really believe that I need to maybe refer to my notes even more often than I normally would because I don't want to miss anything. And uh, the Lord has really stirred my heart, stirred my spirit. There's a lot that's going on, a lot we have to trust God for. And we know that God is working. There's a lot of things going on behind the scenes. Uh, maybe I'll share a little bit with you as we go through this message this morning. And uh, But I trust that you are all well this morning. I put out a wonderful praise report this week. I was so excited about sharing a lot of praises about what's going on and what's happening in our church family and at the nursing homes and in the prisons and with our missionaries and, and among our own church family. So it's been a good week in a lot of ways, and God is working, and he's doing a lot of good things because, I mean, some things happened this week that I've been praying about now for the last month or so at least, maybe maybe more, and uh, and God has stirred up a lot of things, and, and we believe that he is going to do good things in your life personally, in your family, but then in the church as a whole, and in the church of Jesus Christ at large, uh, as we keep, uh, you know, the big picture. So God is good. I'm going to get started right into the word here this morning. Let's just bow our heads and pray for a minute. Lord, in the name of Jesus, touch our hearts this morning. May we hear your voice and may the glory of God rest upon us here at this time on this Sunday morning in the month of May 2020. In the name of Jesus, amen and amen. You know, Christ's message to the church is not a lot different today than what it was in the time of Revelations. And of course, there were actual churches that Christ spoke to in that first century. And, uh, and of course, they, they were all located in what is known today as modern-day Turkey. It was called Asia Minor at that time, but it's actually in modern-day Turkey today. Prophetically, these messages are speaking to us today in our churches and to us as individuals as well. Let's go into a few of these messages quickly, and then I'm going to share some things that God has laid on my heart for our message here uh, on this Sunday morning at the House of Praise. The first church, and I mentioned this to you a couple of weeks ago, was the church of Ephesus. A wonderful church this was, uh, full of hard workers and patient, full of the Spirit, operating in the power of the Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit. But the rebuke that Christ had for them that they had lost their first love. They had lost their fire. They had lost their desire. They had lost their first love and had become like a cruise ship instead of the battleship that they were called to be. And that was a rebuke that Christ had for them. And the primary application for us today as we look at this and the church of Ephesus, this is really important to see this, that we need to do self-examination. Everybody say self-examination. And are there any times in my life that I was closer to God than I am now? If yes, then I have to get off the fence, so to speak, and make a decision for Christ. No time to waste. I need a sense of urgency. 
And that's a message that the Lord has given today. I believe that much of what you're going to hear now in these next few minutes is prophetic coming directly from the Word of God. Some of it will be prophecy coming directly from your pastor and maybe even others. And if it is from others, I will mention as to who uttered these prophecies. That God is indeed speaking to the church of Jesus Christ at large, but very specifically to the house of praise here this morning. The second church that Christ spoke to was the church at Smyrna. It endured martyrdom and a lot of difficult times. Smyrna was a church that was dead at one time, but came alive. And that was a wonderful commendation coming from Christ. And it learned and fully understood the value of repentance. And Christ had no rebuke for this church. The primary application for us today that our roots must go down deep in the Word of God. Deep in the Word of God. This will give us strength in the time of difficulty or even persecution. And subsequently, the hard times. And even make us stronger and develop a deeper relationship with Jesus Christ than you've ever had before. That's why the Apostle Paul saw that the hard times that he had were a good thing because it actually helped him and helped him to develop and grow. He said in Romans, the seventh chapter, why do I do the things that I don't want to do? And I don't do the things that I want to do. He was going through some growth times himself. And the difficult times that he faced as we are going through now are going to be times where we can grow and draw closer to God and to become more in a deep relationship with him, to hear his voice and to be obedient like we never have before. The next church that Christ addresses in the book of Revelations is the church at Pergamos. This church was strong in faith and did not deny the faith, and that's certainly a good thing, and suffered from the acceptance, though, of the union of church and state. This subsequently caused them to enter into idolatry and to express worship to entities other than to God alone. This was a great rebuke of Jesus Christ for this church. And this can easily happen and has happened in today's churches as well. The primary application for us this morning is number one, be careful, do not engage with the world systems in any way as they can alter your perspective and even your strategy in life itself. An adulterous relationship with the world is dangerous. And it is dangerous, and this is a word coming from your pastor this morning. And, of course, number two, be careful of religious spirits. They are dangerous and will positively distort your view of the true gospel. So that's really important. Let's go on to the next church, Thyra Tyra. And this was the message that Christ had for Thyatira. This church, once again, had a lot of faith and trusted God for many parts of their life. And this was admirable, without a doubt. But Thyatira was a counterfeit church and eventually became anti-Christ. Imagine that. Actually became anti-Christ. And this can happen, and we've seen that happen even in churches today. Christ's rebuke was that they literally were controlled by a Jezebel spirit. That is, controlling spirits. And these things can happen. We've seen those type of spirits enter churches and, and, and even try to penetrate a church. And we've got to be very careful of that. The primary, the primary application for us today is to understand that any kind connection with demon activity is an affront to God, period. Amen. The most deceiving connection of this nature is the spirit of Jezebel, which is an ugly spirit of control, manipulation, and witchcraft, which is mind control. Paul's famous words apply here. The spirit of rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. The next church that Christ addressed in the second and third chapter of the book of Revelations is the church at Sardis. This church was into reformation, always looking for new ways to do things, and uh, got off track by doing that. Christ's rebuke was that they were dead spiritually. They had the appearance of being alive, but were dead in their relationship with Jesus Christ, as Christ talked about in Matthew, the seventh chapter. You need to read Matthew, the seventh chapter, and that'll give you an 
an insight as to what Christ and what Christ's view was on this particular issue of having no relationship with Christ. The primary application for us is a dead church is a church that appears alive by earthly or fleshly standards, but is dead to Christ, dead to the Holy Spirit, not sensitive to the things of the Spirit. Amen. A church body can die in many ways. That is through lethargy, legalism, religious spirits, infiltration of the world, just to name a few. And the message to us is to be on guard against this and avoid it at all cost, because it'll make a big difference in our ongoing relationship with the Lord. The next church that Christ addressed in the book of Revelations is the church at Philadelphia. This church was an evangelistic and a missionary-minded church. They no doubt had a wonderful relationship with Christ and were always anxious to share the message of the gospel. And Christ had no rebuke for this church, had no rebuke at all. The church was full of the agape love of God. The primary application for us, this message is a demonstration of the power of agape love. Love builds faith, eradicates selfishness, and develops humility. It is the most powerful force in the universe. That's agape love, the God kind of love. We are the most like Christ when we love. It is the foundation for all of Christianity. And that's a very powerful thing to make sure that we get it deep into our spirit. Loving and giving and being like Christ, this is what agape love is all about. We become like Father God. And, of course, the last church that he addressed, this was the church at Laodicea. Christ had no commendation for this church at all. It was a lukewarm church, and it made him sick. It actually said it made him sick. Lukewarmness is when we are neither cold, which is out of relationship with Christ altogether, or hot, and that would mean in an in intense relationship with Christ. Not only are we not useful to the kingdom if we're lukewarm, but it causes deception and confusion in the body of Christ. This does not please God. Amen. The primary application for us today is this message is the warning against lukewarmness in the church. How can we serve leftovers to a holy God? I've put it this way that when, when, if Christ would come to our house, we'd want to serve him the finest of food and we would make him most comfortable. We would do everything to do what is right. Well, spiritually, we should be doing the same thing. How can we serve leftovers to a holy God? How can we come before him empty? It is made clear that lukewarmness is an affront to God and he does not tolerate it. This is in brief, a very brief summary of the message of Jesus Christ to the seven churches of Revelation. And it is a message to our church today. And it is a message to the church at large. But more so, and even more important, it's a message to us as individuals here this morning. You know, the Holy Spirit is speaking to me today and has been really speaking to me so clear over the last month in particular. And our focus at this time is that we are right now between Resurrection Day and Pentecost Sunday. And this is very interesting. You know, this was the first time in 2,000 years that Passover was not properly celebrated. It was just observed. We were all in our house praying that this plague, if you will, would pass over. Passover was fully and truly experienced this year. Amen. There was a lot of prophecy that the coronavirus would begin to dissipate or break up around Easter time or the Passover season of this year. And this indeed started to happen. Uh, the, the, the lines began to flatten, so to speak, and, and all there, there, there's been some changes and, and many challenges even since then in the last few weeks. But the next phase as we are moving into this next season is Pentecost, 50 days 
after Resurrection Day. This is the day on Sunday, May 31st. It is likely that Pentecost will be experienced this year. That's a prophetic word coming from your pastor. Something different is going to happen. Your life is going to be changed. Something's going to happen in your family. There's going to be something happen in the church. There's going to be some dramatic things that will take place, and I believe that with all my heart. God acts in amazing ways and many times has in, in into ancient holidays, and, and he ties what he does into the ancient holidays many times. Not all the time, but many times. I am praying that we will experience something special on Pentecost this year. Number one, we all need a fresh new baptism in the Holy Spirit. We need to be refreshed. Everyone should be right now seeking it with all of their heart. We need to be renewed. I'm feeling in my spirit that this is going to happen for a lot of reasons this year. However, the key to this happening is prayer and worship, and it must start right now. The church at large must have a stirring and revival. That is a mature revival that will carry us into the next phase. That is a major shift, if you will, approaching the end of the church age. And this is what God is preparing us all for. However, based upon some research, there certainly seems to be some high-level corruption, which we have been facing, which is very disturbing. For example, it is a disgrace that churches are forced to stay closed and Planned Parenthood still performs abortions. That is a disgrace in our nation. This is of the devil. I believe that much of this high-level corruption is linked directly with the end times evil and is leading into the challenges of the church that we will see in Bible prophecy at the end of the church age. Amen. Just prior to the rapture of the church. But God, we are victorious and we will overcome in Christ. Come on, everybody, say that with your pastor right now. Say, but God, we are victorious and we will overcome in Christ. Amen. Many parts, not all, of the government have corruption, as we know, and are overstepping their mark trying to take away some of our civil liberties, and this is wrong. Amen. We believe that social distancing and a reasonable amount of separation during this national and global pandemic is correct and has had some benefit. But it is obvious that many of the governors especially have overstepped their mark and are not opening up their state fast enough in the right way. And it is very obvious to me uh, that opening a state must consider everything involved and everybody involved. Amen. Individuals, uh, needs of families, the economy of the state and country, supply chain needs, and of course the definition of what is essential. Amen. I was on a Zoom call with many pastors just yesterday, and we all agree that we are going to pursue the importance of having churches deemed as essential, and we're all going to be pursuing that, and you need to pray for your pastor and all the pastors of South Jersey. And, and the, this is obviously out of order. You know, when, when, when the, the church of Jesus Christ is not considered essential. Amen. For example, does something seem to be wrong with this picture that we can go to ShopRite, we can go to Walmart, Home Depot, but we cannot meet in our church? Also, the opening of our state should be by region, directly connected with what the severity of the situation in our region is, not by other regions of the state. And of course, talking to some, it's become evident that uh, they're very passionate to see the devil's power broken and the corruption exposed, and we admire that. Carol and I feel the same way, absolutely. We have invested a lot of time over the last eight weeks to research these many issues. I have invested countless hours in prayer about these things. I do not move quickly on matters like this, especially when matters like this involve so many people, people and their families and extended families. We invest precious time in the presence of God. He always is faithful in speaking to me. It is not about me. It is not what I want, but always focused on him and what he is doing. So we make our moves. We move in the power of the Holy Spirit. 
and we will not move in the flesh in the name of, we're not going to be moved by the opinions of others, the pressure coming from others or anything. It's going to be by the Spirit of God. Isaiah 55, 8, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, says the Lord. I just wanted to make that, that point really strong, that your pastor is locked into the power of the Holy Spirit, and we are moving in the power of the Spirit in every decision we make. We are moving right now. We are connected with two large groups of pastors in South Jersey, that we are all discussing exactly what has to be done to reopen our churches. And we want to do things that are right. We don't want to be just rebellious and rogue. No, we want to be in the power of the Spirit, following God's direction, make sure that we're hearing God and doing things in the right way. And it's important that we are considerate of the safety of others and do things that are right. So it's this it's this delicate balance that, that we are all pursuing. All of us have a desire. In fact, there's a drive right now that, that we would love to see our churches open, even what we're calling maybe a soft open, or maybe in, in parking lots, parking, or whatever, whatever God opens up. We'd like to see something happen by day of Pentecost, May 31st, and that's our prayer right now, and we're seeking that. You need to be praying for your pastor. You need to be praying for the pastors of South Jersey. You need to be lifting them up in prayer, intercession and worship, and prayer and praise. These are inseparable virtues of the Holy Spirit, and that is what's going to make the difference. That is what we have as our tools. Amen. America needs to repent. Amen. I've said this over and over, and I'll say it again this morning. America has committed great sins that have brought much of this curse on our nation. The sins of the shedding of innocent blood and abortion, the transgender agenda and homosexuality, hatred, bitterness, racism, lawlessness, lack of respect for authority, just to name a few. These are sins that must be repented of. Yes, our churches should be allowed to open, and the lockdown should be alleviated, especially especially as all health precautions are taken in consideration for each other. Amen. It is a crime that local police have arrested people meeting in a parking lot or in a field, all practicing social distancing, wearing masks, and being mindful of each other and the federal recommendations. These actions from the local government are all signs of, of a touch of socialism and government control. Amen. We have never seen such blindness and confusion, all based upon selfishness, greed, and demonic controlling spirits. You need to know where your pastors are. Pastor Carol and I, you need to understand where our heart is on this. We want to see the will of God done. We understand that we're in this end time. We understand that it's going to be even increasing the closer we get to the end of the church age. Carol and I believe that the strongest power we have in our hands is prayer and intercession. Angelic forces are standing at attention, waiting for Father God to dispatch them. Do you believe that? I believe that with all of my heart. Angelic forces are standing at attention waiting for Father God to dispatch them. If my people will humble themselves, if my people will pray, if my people will seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and heal their land. That's 2 Chronicles 7, 14, which we have prayed so, so many times in our church. You should hear our heart on a very important matter, and I've shared this with a few others in our church, and, and this is really important that we express this, that our heart goes out to the many who have suffered and are suffering and have died. And I sit here and, 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 and I have shed many tears thinking about this in the middle of the night, uh, praying and, and, and thinking about you know the, the pain that families have went through. Oh my, I mean, I, I, I do not see these, this as commodities. I, I just don't see it that way. I just don't see it that way at all. I, I see, uh, you know, the, these are grandmas, grandpas. These are daddies, moms, aunts, uncles, sons, daughters excuse me, daughters. And, and this is exactly what's going on. Thousands and thousands of precious people, you know, that, that are just considered, quote unquote, the deceased or, or the dead. The Holy Spirit has spoken to me as the pastor of this church that we live in and teach compassion. 
say compassion for these precious people. Amen. And to never have any selfish agenda that would override or overshadow the knowledge of this pain and suffering. You need to know where Carol and I are on this. And I know I'm giving you a lot this morning. I trust that you will hit, you know, the, the link uh, into this YouTube and watch this video many times. You'll have to, you'll have to, in order to grasp everything that we're sharing here this morning. Our focus is and will continue to be first and foremost on the great loss of these families. Yes, be militant in exposing evil, of course, and praying to get things corrected, of course but always secondary to the alleviation of this pain and suffering. And we got to pray for these families in the loss of loved ones and those that are in pain, amen, that are in hospitals now in the name of Jesus. God spoke to me as he spoke to Moses, and this is something else that I've shared with some others in our church. What do you have in your hand? And Moses answered and said, I've got a staff. It was a shepherd's staff. And of course, we know that God taught him how to use that staff, amen? And then God said the same thing to me, what do you have in your hand? And I answered God and I said, I have the internet. And then he said to me, now use it for my glory. And that's what all of our uh, pastors are doing, doing the best we can. It's, it's not like meeting together. It's not like being together on a Sunday morning. We all know that. But it's the next best thing, and the gospel is continuing to go out. In fact, it's going out more and reaching more than we ever have reached in the past. Amen. I have the internet. That's what I said back to God. Then he said, use it for my glory. And that's exactly what we've done. We have used just old-fashioned phone calls to stay in touch with many of you, email, text communications, voice memos, YouTube videos, Facebook, and have reached not only our entire church family, but thousands more with the gospel message. Many of our messages have, have been viewed by literally thousands, two, three, four, and, and, and in one case, one, one rare case, it went over 6,000 views for that message called, yeah, that, that we had preached, uh, I think it was back in February, in our Ephesian series on holiness. We have reached our entire church family on a personal level as well as in a group. So the gospel message has continued to go out. No one has said we can't preach the gospel. No one has said we can't teach the gospel of Jesus Christ. So we continue to do it. Amen. House of Praise is functioning as normal, okay, in every way, with exception to our physically meeting on Sunday morning. And then, of course, our stopgap method on Sunday, Thirsty Thursday, and with the wows and, and with our men of honor has been to use the internet and media. You know, the same word of God has been preached and continues to go out faithfully. Every other ministry, including From the Pastor's Heart, Mountain Moving Moments, outreaches to our missionaries in Guatemala, Haiti, Savannah, uh, and support to sex slavery abolitionists, which is the Four Dignity Ministry, benevolent giving to our members, full sermons of a variety of subjects, prayer ministries, outreaches to the prison through emails, letters, phone calls, and our nursing homes through DVDs, CDs, and phone call ministries. All are alive and well. So you need to know that church is not shut down. It is not shut down at all. Rather, it's actually reaching more than ever. So God has anointed what, and we all do it differently. Different pastors use different softwares and different systems, and some will use YouTube and some will use Facebook and different things, but it doesn't matter. The gospel is continuing to go out. The temporary lockdown has not inhibited our ministry in any way or prevented the gospel of Jesus Christ from being taught, preached, or spread. Somebody said amen. However, we are aware that physically meeting is more effective for the local church functions because of our need for community, without a doubt. The challenge is now getting back on our feet as a nation and getting the country and economy to recover. This is where we see so much opposition with the exposure of the deep state corruption, which keeps coming out more and more each day. God has allowed America to fall back into a financial status not much different than that of the year 2008. I see this event as an opportunity for a major reset. Amen. Spiritually, of course, is my big focus. 
However, it's a it's an opportunity for a major reset in so many things in our nation. And on top of this, China emerges as a key player. And of course, uh, there has been some prophecy that China would rise as a dominant force several years ago. And there appears to be some financial reprieve with the new president building a strong economy over the last three and a half years. But suddenly it was dismantled by God. Amen. It was just dismantled. Yes, it is true that the devil, what the devil means for evil, God will turn for good. This dismantling is for the benefit of all of America. We will recover. If we all pull together, we will recover. Pray for small businesses. Pray for people in financial situations. Some are okay and many are not. Be sensitive to that. Be sensitive to reach out to those that are hurting financially. I believe that there will be a lot of good come out of this crisis if we handle it correctly. America has been set back without a doubt. We are in a critical moment where the destiny of America is being determined. Uh, okay, The book of Haggai speaks to this issue so well. Israel had, uh, had been taken into Babylonian exile in the year 587 B.C., and 70 years later, returned to Jerusalem, but only to find the temple, their place of worship, was in ruins. Haggai's assignment from God was to bring honor and focus back to the house of God, which was the temple that Solomon had built. The people failed at first, but they got back on track after Haggai ministered to them. Haggai prophesied against them because they had focused on rebuilding their own homes and neglected the house of God. Does that sound familiar? That has happened. Amen. Haggai is the book of the shaking, too. The greatest wake-up call or shaking at this time is more directed toward the church. If my people who are called by my name. That's addressing the, that us, that, that's addressing the church. That's addressing you and I. If my people called by my name. Look closely at the two verses preceding the famous verse. The famous verse that we all quote is 2 Chronicles seven fourteen. But let's look at verse 12 and 13. And the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said unto him, I have heard thy prayer and have chosen this place to myself for an house of sacrifice. If I shut up heaven and there be no more rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among the people, that's talking about a pandemic. It appears here in Scripture that the church is a major factor which stands in proxy to determine the fate of America. And I believe that. Do you believe that? I believe that with all my heart. It's not who's in the White House. It, it's the activity of the church and what we are doing at the power of God, at the, at the bidding of the Holy Spirit. I think it's important that we do not just say, give us a few more years to rebuild the economy. And, and of course, you know, We've proven that we can do that, excuse me, before and, and, and get our focus off of God. Amen. This is really an error. We, the church, are God's focus right now. It is because we are the presence of God on earth. We are the presence of God on earth. And it's through his presence that there will be healing and recovery. It's through the presence of God in the church of Jesus Christ that there will be healing and recovery. This is an assignment for the church. Amen. Hallelujah. We must discern every disunity that operates in the church, and there will be shakings, there will be divisions, but Paul said at one point that if divisions erupt in the church, allow them to flow as God will make manifest each one, and they will expose themselves. God wants unity in the body of Christ. Amen. Unity. Standing behind your pastor, praying for your pastor. And, and supporting your pastor. This is so important. This must be improved, and it's not something we can do. It must be a work of the Holy Spirit through prayer, worship, and intercession. What we have taught through the years at House of Praise, uh, that is our responsibility in the church, isn't just to, to get people saved, but it's to teach the importance of the sanctification of the soul. It's to make disciples. Jesus said, go and make disciples. Amen. So it's certainly 
more than just the initial gospel message, but it's to take it to the next level. God delivered Israel out of Egypt at Passover, but he had to get Egypt out of Israel at the first fruits. Amen. This is important. Did you hear what your pastor just said? God delivered Israel out of Egypt at Passover, but he had to get Egypt out of Israel at first fruits. Okay. Now, the passing through of the Red Sea, a type of water baptism, as it tells us there in Paul's letter to the Corinthian church, was the cutting off of the enemy. When the children of Israel went into the Red Sea, and of course we know how God by his mighty power brought the sea back on the enemy, and the enemy was cut off. That's what happens in our life. When we get sanctified and filled with the Holy Spirit, the enemy gets cut off. Amen. Hallelujah. Is it getting clearer the responsibility of the church is to not only bring people to Christ, but also to disciple them, lead them into a relationship with Jesus Christ? How is the church doing on this assignment? This is one of the key responsibilities of House of Praise, as God has called us to be a church where mature Christians can go deeper with God. Not all churches have the same identical assignment. We have taught this so many times through the years. Not understanding this has caused some to be critical of a church or ministry, and even condescending on a ministry or even the pastor at times because their calling may be different. God has a calling that is on the church. I put that out on a pastor's heart message just today. Be true to our calling. And that's my call upon my people in the house of praise. Be true to your calling. Stay in your lane that God has put you in. Amen. I do not believe that God has written America off, but I do believe that he is waking us up. I am shaking the nations. I am shaking you. Consider your ways, saith the Lord. Amen. We need to get involved with God's building project. And one of his key projects, I believe, is to rebuild America right now. Amen. For his glory, America just had a wrecking ball hit us. Come on, guys. That's what hit us. But we're still here. Amen. Maybe we just have to reorganize. Rick Joyner has said for a number of years that he believes that the new big is small. He said the new big is small. Lance Wall now has called them micro churches as compared to mega churches, okay? Francis Chan has also had some awesome direction on this idea for the church going forward. The devil thinks he, is, he has shut down the church, but quite to the contrary, Christ has opened up thousands of churches in homes all across this nation. Now, this is not to say that God is not in a big church. Don't hear your pastor saying that. That's not what I said. I'm just simply saying that God can work in a small church, in a home church, in a ministry that is reaching out to one poor soul in a nursing home. is just as important to God as a large megachurch. You need to understand how God views the church. The church has risen in a different way. Now in the time for the ecclesia to arise. It is time, amen, for the ecclesia to arise, for the small to become the new big, for the David to take on Goliath. There is a huge opportunity in this shaking when Goliath taunted Israel for 40 days, and, uh, and, and we've been in this quarantine in around that, probably a little more now. This created an opportunity for David. Remember, shaking is not necessarily a punishment when God shakes something. It's not necessarily a Don't look at it that way, but it can be a blessing. Say it can be a blessing. This is indeed a shake up to wake up. Amen. God showed me that. A shake up to wake up. I feel the presence of the Lord even now here on my back deck as I'm sharing this with you. At one point, prophet Clem, Kim Clement prophesied that God was dissatisfied with both political parties. God does not ride on the backs of donkeys and elephants. There is only one focus, and that is the Lamb, and that is Jesus Christ. Amen. Hallelujah. Now, I'm not against political parties, their personal preferences. I'm just saying that that's not the way God works. That's not the way he sees it. He sees it different. Excuse me, differently than this. This brings us to the incredible experience that Joshua had. And I want to share this. I know this message is going a little bit longer. Please bear with me. This is what God told me to share. I trust that you will have a few more minutes to spend with me on this Sunday morning. 
This brings us to the incredible experience that Joshua had. Joshua was out surveying the city of Jericho and planning his battle strategy. How would he be able to take this tightly shut fortified city with its king and valiant warriors? It says that the walls of Jericho were so thick that, that horses and chariots ran on the top of the walls. Suddenly there was a dramatic, unexpected appearance of a mysterious man with a drawn sword in combat readiness, and Joshua immediately went over and asked him, Are you for us, or are you for our adversaries? Whose side are you on? Joshua immediately recognized the supernatural character of this visitor. Joshua was in the presence of God. Oh, Lord, in the name of Jesus. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth, and he bowed down and said to him, What has my Lord to say to his servant? And Joshua fell on his face and worshipped in the presence of God. It's not about some good feeling. It's not about some snappy worship song, as wonderful as they are. Nobody loves music more than I do. But it's about recognizing the presence of God. Amen. Who is this person? Who did Joshua really encounter? It was Yahweh himself. It was Jesus Christ. Amen. The total impact of the context of this passage indicates that a superhuman person was present. He was in the presence of deity, and Joshua knew it. Amen. The commander of the army was the Lord God himself. It was the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Yahweh has come to lead and fight for his people. The captain of the Lord of hosts said, I'm not on either side. I've just come to take over. Amen. Hallelujah. Why did this happen? Probably for the same reason he will show up again in this culture. The church simply has not shown up, and I think that we need to get stronger. The church needs to be unified, working together. No more big eyes and little U's. Amen. It's not about a kingdom on earth. It's not about my opinion or your opinion. It's not about a musical genre or talent or how photogenic a person is on television. Amen. Israel camped around the presence of of God. And that's what I tell you over and over, that God has called the house of praise to be a presence-driven church. Hebrews 12, 27. Now this yet once more indicates the removal of those things which are shaken as of the things that are made, that the things which cannot be shaken may remain. Amen. God is shaking everything that can be shaken so that the things that cannot be shaken will remain shaking all that can be shaken on the earth, and in the second heaven includes political structures. It includes that, say, God is still in control. Amen. God is saying, I am building a new house. God says, I will give you a signet ring. What was a signet ring in that culture? It it depicted authority. It, it, it depicted, in, in our case, as we think of it, as, as Jesus Christ, it, it depicts deity and power. Amen. Where the imprint of heaven will come into play. God wants to give you a signet ring. Do you understand that? Amen. The authority has been given to the church of Jesus Christ. Jesus retrieved the keys of the kingdom, took them off the devil, and gave them back to who they were originally intended. And that's the people of God, the church of Jesus Christ. I'm here to say that Pentecost this year is crucial. The church will make this decision with our surrender and submission to the Holy Spirit. You will be part of that decision of how much is actually accomplished in the next few weeks. Amen. I do believe this. And we must do it in unity. By Pentecost, we will be in the upper room spiritually. We will all be together in the upper room. We must fully surrender egos, personal agendas. Amen. Find the stones that God has linked you with. The Word of God calls them living stones. 1 Peter 2, 5, as you come to him, the living stone, rejected by man, but chosen and precious in God's sight, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy 
priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, See, I lay in Zion a stone, a chosen and precious cornerstone, that the one who believes in him will never be put to shame. This is foundational, so divine restoration can begin. And the church is a huge part of this. Amen. I have a closing prayer now that we can focus on before we wrap this up here this morning. I trust that you all have listened intently as to what the Holy Spirit was saying here this morning. We must pray for our president and all those in authority. He has enemies right in his own house, of course. I'm talking about the White House. He has solved many problems, but this one he cannot solve. Amen. It will bring him to his knees, and I trust that it has. Amen. Lord, restore the jobs, O God, of those that have lost jobs. Restore the finances of people that are short on cash because of lack of work. And of course, Lord, I, I pray that you will, Father, that you will start up the engine of our economy in our nation once again. We must stop building our paneled houses, as we read in the book of Haggai, while letting the Lord's house, the church, go to ruin. Amen. That's what Haggai rebuked the people for. He said, you are worried about building your paneled houses and taking care of yourself, and the house of God was in ruins. But then, of course, there was repentance, and they did restore um, the temple, which was the place of worship at that time. Today, it's not a building. We're not talking about brick and mortar. We're talking about relationship with Jesus Christ. That's what we're talking about this morning. Lord, forgive us. God will always work through a remnant. Praise God for that. Raise up a movement in America, O oh Lord, to establish what you want. Anoint with the tongues of fire once again, O oh my God. We rebuke the spirit that is working toward a socialist takeover in our nation. Deliver us from evil. Give us clarity and a clear vision and the ability to see clearer than we ever have seen before. Amen. Hallelujah. Now, this is important. Lord, may you establish the small as the new big. If that's what you're going to do, there's so many good things that can happen. Lord, just one can chase a thousand and and two can chase ten thousand scripture says imagine the power that's in a church doesn't whether it's big or small it doesn't matter god will work through it just the same may we experience prevailing prayer worship and intercession lord pray lord we pray for us and all of us in the church oh god our children and our grandchildren lord we bring our families before you in the name of jesus we also pray for the country of Brazil. I know that there's been some, some stirrings there of great revival, and we do pray for that country as well. Protect us, Lord, from the spirit of Antichrist. Amen. Because the spirit of Antichrist exists now, even though the Antichrist in a person is coming, and that will come, that's predicted, and that will happen during the tribulation period in the first 42 months in the second 42 months, that, that seven-year period prophesied in the book of Revelation, which we'll be talking about shortly in our teaching coming up shortly. But the spirit of Antichrist is here now. Oh, Lord, in the name of Jesus, be with our elderly and those with underlying conditions. Bring healing and safety to them, oh God. Bring healing, oh God, to those who have contacted this virus, oh God, and protect those who have not. In the name of Jesus, comfort families, oh God, that have lost loved ones, oh God, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray for the businesses that are opening now, for wisdom, for strength and peace. We pray for financial wisdom and divine divine provision for the people of God. Lord, we are ready. Lord, we pray that we will experience a great recovery tied into Pentecost this year on May 31st. Amen. In the name of Jesus. This message has been from the heart of Jesus, and it's been from my heart as well, from my heart to yours. God bless you. We love you this morning. I, I just feel so stirred in my spirit. I trust that you have received the word of the Lord here this morning. God bless you. We love you all.